Hello, everyone. Welcome to the public speaking, lose the fear, learn the relevance webinar. My name is Jesse Lester, and I'm the education development supervisor with Toastmasters International. Thank you all for joining us. Today's webinar is the first in our public speaking series, and we're excited that you're with us today. Please submit your questions through the question and answer pane. So there will be a designated period at the end of today's webinar where we will take questions. With so many attendees, we may not be able to answer all of your questions, but we will do our best and we thank you in advance for your patience. And a few other housekeeping notes. Also feel free to use the chat pane to talk with one another during today's webinar. Just know that our team will be focused on answering questions that come through the question and answer pane. Also, please be courteous and polite to your fellow attendees. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email in a few days with a link so that you can view and share that recording. Now, before we get started, let's pause and take a gauge of where everyone is at on today's topic. So you should see a poll on your screen and go ahead and answer the question on a scale from one to five, how would you rate your fear of public speaking? I'm seeing lots of great answers come in. We're gonna go ahead and end that poll so that we can look at the results together. Thank you everyone for sharing your answers. We're gonna go ahead and share that with you so that we can look at this together. And as you can see, we have many people on today's webinar who are maybe a little scared of public speaking or quite a bit scared of public speaking. So the good news is that you're not alone and you have come to the right place. So thank you for joining us today. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Tammy Miller. Tammy is in the business of changing lives. A longtime member and leader in Toastmasters International, she is the president and CEO of Tammy Speaks and Tammy Miller Auctions. She works as an auctioneer, author, and speech coach. As a professional speaker, her topics include communication skills, motivation, leadership, humor, and healing. As a speech coach, she has helped leaders from all walks of life become better communicators. Her company, Tammy Miller Auctions, provides local and global auction services specializing in real estate and fundraising auctions. An adjunct professor at Penn State University in Pennsylvania, United States, Tammy teaches presentation and communication skills. She is the author of four books and is a contributing columnist to national and international publications. Thank you, Tammy, for being with us today. Thank you, Jesse. I'm really excited to be here and we have a great panel for you today. So let's go ahead and find out who they are. I'm excited to introduce our first panelist, Anweishe Banerjee. Anweishe is a trained behavioral and molecular neuroscientist currently working as assistant scientist at a lab at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, United States. Apart from science, she loves public speaking and has been an active member of Toastmasters for over seven years. She is well-versed in facilitation, communication, and leadership skills, winning various awards and commendations for her speeches and presentations. She recently delivered her first TEDx presentation, where she shared the idea of how to deal with stage fright from the perspective of neuroscience. So please welcome Anweishe. Next is John. John Bow is our second expert with us today. John has written for the New Yorker Magazine, the New York Times Magazine, and many others. He has spent the last eight years working on his new book, I Have Something to Say, Mastering the Art of Public Speaking in an Age of Disconnection. It's published in August of 2020 by Penguin Random House, and it explores the ancient history of rhetoric. John joined Toastmasters to learn for himself how to become a better speaker and in the process, he discovered how the spoken word is more relevant than ever in modern life. So welcome, John. 
Our third panelist today is Liz Jin. Liz started her career as a corporate lawyer in New York and London. She is currently the Director of Business Affairs at the Coca-Cola Company in Atlanta, Georgia, United States, where she negotiates and manages celebrity talent deals and music, sports, gaming, and entertainment sponsorship deals. Liz has been a member of Toastmasters since 2014 and served as the past president of Coca-Cola's in-house 310 North Toastmasters Club. She credits Toastmasters for inspiring her to start her storytelling blog and motivational YouTube channel, Unbury That Badass. So let's get to it and start learning about how to lose the fear of public speaking and learn the relevance. So Liz, we're gonna start with you today with our first question. Can you tell us briefly what made you decide to take that first step towards becoming a more confident presenter? And how is this investment in public speaking relevant in your career now? Uh, sure, thank you, Tammy. I, uh, I had an interesting start to Toastmasters. I didn't actually join because I wanted to be a better presenter per se. In general, when I look back at that time in my life, I was feeling a bit stuck, just personally and professionally. And so more than the fear of public speaking, it was a fear of feeling stuck like this forever and ever. And I had a Coca-Cola has a Toastmasters club as part of a corporate club. And I thought I would just check it out. I did want to become a better speaker. And to my utmost surprise, what I didn't realize was as I became a better speaker and I put in the work week after week to do more speeches, that it would really impact every other part of my life. Because as I became more confident as a speaker and a presenter, I didn't realize that that would benefit every single relationship in my life. And not only did I lose the fear of becoming um, a, a unsure a public speaker, but it helped me lose my fear of just how I was facing my life. Um, it, the skills that I got from Toastmasters helped me when I got laid off from my job. It helped me to just embrace the fact that I possessed these public speaking skills that were really valuable and that were totally transferable to anywhere else I went. And subconsciously, that attitude helped me to take more risks. It helped me get a better job and pivot my career. And so I would say in my current life, Toastmasters has absolutely made a huge impact, not only in improving my self-confidence, but helping me be more fearless in just how I interact with um, opportunities that come my way. Absolutely. There's so many hidden benefits that we don't even realize. We just think it's, you know, speaking at the beginning and so much more than that. Thank you, Liz, for that. John, would you like to add something to that comment? Sure. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks for inviting me to participate in this. I'm watching everybody come and say hi from every single state and every single part of the world, and there is nothing cooler than that. <laughs> um, my story is funny because I never did decide that I want to become a more confident speaker. I was dragged into it kicking and screaming against my will. Uh, you mentioned my book. About 10 years ago when I started to write it, the plan was to write about speech and you guys and Toastmasters and what it does for people to learn the art of speaking and how that frees them up. And I wanted to study the history of that, how the Greeks invented this whole way of teaching it. And then this, you know, the neuroscience of it and the psychiatric benefits of it and all of this stuff. And I handed in my first draft and my editor said, wow, this is all super fascinating, but where are you in the book? And my attitude was kind of like, I'm a writer. I write about other people. I don't write about myself. And they said, no, 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 that's not going to work here. That's not, that's not good. We want to see you go through this journey that you're celebrating and talking about so enthusiastically. And I argued and I fought and I lost. And here I am. And now I can do this without <laughs> melting down. And my job is basically to talk to people and companies and explain everything I learned in the book and everything that we learn in Toastmasters. So it's just like Jen said, it's, it's utterly transformative on every single level of my life. Well, that's great, John, because you're losing having to join Toastmasters was certainly a win for us. We're so glad that you're able to join us and add so much. And that was a great segue about the neuroscience because, and Weishe, that's what you're talking about. So do you have comments that you would like to add to what Liz and John have said about uh, what this is all about joining Toastmasters? Yes, absolutely. I'm uh, agreeing with John and Liz. I probably followed that route of 
uh, the neuroscience affecting my public speaking skill when I had to get up in front of a crowd and do my pub first public presentation. You have a region in the brain called amygdala, which kicks in the moment you are in a fearful situation. I could feel my amygdala kick in big time when I had to do my presentation. And over a period of time, I realized that I must do something actively to get it more under control. So neuroscience uh, plays a big role in uh, the fear part of it. But the good news is that this is something we can have control on. This We will not die because of this fear. And that, that's something I realized after being part of Toastmasters. It just, you have to keep practicing. You have to keep, keep getting the feedback from everybody and take one of those little steps. That's what I have been doing all this time because I joined thinking that, a oh, few days of public speaking and get better with the presentation skill and I will be out of this place. But seven years later, I'm still here because you don't realize how it keeps benefiting you continuously. It's a continuous growth and improvement. Mm -hmm. And that's so true. You know, with Toastmasters, we have people that are just coming in that are really very, very fearful of it. And we have people that are professional speakers because it helps us hone our skills and it, no matter where we're at, as far as our path and journey is concerned. So it's great that we're hearing, oh, this is where I started and this is kind of where I've gone. So great. All right, the next question, Liz, I'm gonna to direct to you to get us started. So talking in front of a crowd of any size is one of the most dreaded forms of communication. People fear being judged or evaluated by others. So can you offer some advice to someone who is terrified of speaking before an audience and how can they get past that fear? Sure. Well, as Anwish I was saying, Practice certainly comes with that and overcoming that amygdala response. But of course, there's a first time for everything. And the first time you get up there, I've been doing this for many years. And even though I can't see any of the audience members out there, I I'm nervous because I want to make sure that I am doing a good job as well. And so for me, what really helped, one, was being part of a club that was such a supportive environment, knowing that you are in a place where everyone is there for the same reason, or there might be a different motivations that got them there, but they're all there to better themselves, which I think is such a phenomenal environment because you're with like-minded people. And I feel those people tend to also be very supportive and they want the best for you. And so I would say my second piece of advice for people who are terrified of public speaking is assuming positive intent of the audience. I know when I'm in an audience, that's the easy part, just sitting back and sometimes sitting behind a, a camera that's turned off and just listening. But I want whoever is up there to succeed. I want to be entertained. I want them to inspire me and say something that's going to resonate with me. And knowing that people are not who are in the audience, they want you to succeed. And I think some of that fear comes from the fact that you think people are waiting for you to mess up. And so much of your, your mess ups are all in your head. People are not paying attention to that at all. They're probably just impressed that you're up there to begin with sharing your story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's a very, a very supportive environment for sure. Yes. Um, Weishay, what do you think about that? Do you have some comments to add? Yes, I, of course, whatever Liz says, is, it's right. But one other thing I always advise people is that when you are getting into it, when you're saying that I'm going to do this, you are already setting yourself apart from the rest of the crowd because you are brave enough to say, I'm going to do it. You're putting in the hard work. So that's my first advice that feel brave. It's, it's not really, you, you have decided it's not easy, but you have decided to do it that itself should feel, make you feel really good. And the second piece of advice is don't try to make your speech or any kind of communication perfect. Because a lot of time is we forget that we are just here to give the big picture and we always fear that we will forget the details, but the audience is really not looking for the details. A secret is nobody really knows what your material is, what you're going to talk about. So it's perfectly fine. If you forget some of the details, just move on. So feel, feel brave and then just, just keep doing it and move on even if you forget something. It, it just, mm -hmm. It's absolutely fine. Good advice for sure. John, how about you? What would you like to add to this? I have one very radical, simple piece of advice. <laughs> 
and I got it from Aristotle. I didn't make it up myself, so I feel very confident in trumpeting it. Um, always think about the audience and stop thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it sounds like a spiritual or a moral command or something like that. And it's not meant to say, oh, you're being selfish or self-centered. It's, it's an actual public speaking technique. It's mm -hmm. sort of like a therapy thing to, to trick your mind into not being anxious. Mm -hmm. So before, when I first joined Toastmasters, my first few speeches, I was more terrified than I was of any high level TV appearance or speech that I had to give in real life because I was focusing so much on myself and what really goes on when I give a speech or give a presentation. And I was dying. I just, all I could think about was how bad I was going to do and how dumb I was going to seem. And everyone was going to see something inside me that was obviously going to be horrible and embarrassing. And so what I eventually learned is before I give a speech, just visualize who am I talking to? How many people are going to be in the room? How old are they? What race? What gender? Why are they there? What do they know about me or my topic? Um, Abraham Lincoln, before he gave the Gettysburg Address, he asked the designer of the outdoor auditorium at Gettysburg, he said, send me a sketch of what the place is going to look like. So the more you visualize and the more you think about the people who are there, the more you know what to talk about, the more you know how they need to hear stuff, the more you need to, you know, the more you understand about what words to use and how to make it easy for them. And for me, that just takes my mind off myself. And it enables me to do a much better job without all of the noise that used to always go on in my brain when I had to do this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's not about me. It's about the audience. Who is the audience? Liz, did you have something you wanted to add to that? I did. And John, that was awesome advice. It just triggered something when you were saying how Abraham Lincoln would try to get a lay of the land before he would speak mm -hmm. and to... Uh, in addition to getting empathy of who he was speaking to, a practical tip is, I know in this pandemic world, you're not really speaking in live places right now, but if you know the room that you're going to speak in, then mm -hmm. by all means, go and practice. So every, any little thing that you can do that's not going to make you nervous, if you can practice with the same audiovisual equipment or with the same slides or in the room configuration and knowing that things can always change and so you're going to have to adapt, but the more that you can focus your mind on just the words that you're going to say, because those are going to make you nervous anyway. But knowing that everything else, you've already got this because you've already practiced in that exact same environment. I have found in the past has really helped me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And practicing and having that confidence. I mean, those are all key parts of it. And the understanding that they do want you to succeed. The audience does want you to succeed. It kind of takes a little bit of pressure off of you too, to just kind of keep moving through and keep going through. And if you make a mistake, keep moving. And that's so important because all of us have stumbled at times, but keep moving. So very good, very good. All right, these are great, great responses. Thank you. So John, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you on this next one. There are some common misconceptions about public speaking. And can you offer up any myths or truths about those misconceptions and, and about speaking itself? I can, and I think that's a great question. It's really, it's really central. Everybody thinks that public speaking has to do with confidence or some emotional state. And if you look at the term speech anxiety, it seems like an emotional condition. So I can't speak well because I'm shy or I had a horrible childhood or whatever. And my feeling is that the reason we can't speak, speak well is because we were never taught how to do it in school. Mm -hmm. So you think about modern education we go to school for 10, 15, 20 years, and almost everything we do is solving problems on paper. Reading, writing, math, it's all on paper. And then you graduate from school into the real world, and it's adults, and it's meetings, and it's fights, and arguments, and family, and real life politics at work. And it's all happening on the level of speech, and it's all happening in real time. Yes, there's a lot of stuff that has to do with screens, but the most important stuff in life happens with speaking. And I think the fact that we're not taught how to do that, obviously that has a lot to do with why we're bad at it and why it makes us anxious. So I think that these sort of old school rules and techniques for learning how to speak, if we learn these things, the anxiety goes away. And you can continue, as Anwesha has said, you know, the fear kind of remains. It's not like it totally goes away, but it just, 
you can be authentic and you can speak well and you can be anxious and all of these things can happen and it has nothing to do with anxiety. It's a thing like if you wanted to learn how to fly a plane and you were anxious about it, you wouldn't address your anxiety, you would address the fact that you don't know how to move the levers and knobs and buttons for the plane. So that's what speech training really is. It teaches you to understand language and it teaches you to understand how people really listen to you. Mm -hmm. And Wei Shay, do you have something you'd like to add on this one? Yes, I wanted to actually add on what, what John was saying about the fear is going to remain because that is something I experienced personally. As a Toastmaster for so many years, I have to speak so much in front of the crowd. I still get nervous. I still get the butterflies in my stomach. So the misconception that don't do any public speaking till you overcome the fear completely mm -hmm. is not, it's a myth for sure. Because no matter how good you are, even if you're a professional speaker, you're going to face some, or you are going to experience some amount of fear just no matter what. I think the good, uh, the good way to really deal with it is that just keep doing it. And mm -hmm. as I, that was an idea I was trying to put across when I was delivering my TED talk is that instead of getting over it, just get used to it. It mm -hmm. almost becomes some kind of habit where you stop paying attention to the butterflies and you can focus on other things. So that's a myth. Don't wait to completely overcome your fear before you start pub your public speaking. Putting those butterflies in formation, right? They're still there, but you know, make them fly in formation. That's exactly right. Liz, how about you? Um, yeah, just to add on, I think some other misconceptions about public speaking is that it has to be in front of this auditorium, in front of hundreds or thousands of people. But as John said, we are persuading and relating and trying to connect with people all the time, all day long. And for those of you on the call who are not familiar with how Toastmasters is structured, there's the speech portion of the meeting, but there's also a portion where you give evaluations live to the speeches that you just heard. And if you think about it, you're also giving feedback on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You are trying to persuade people all day long. And so those skills that you learn in Toastmasters, I use in negotiations, not just with my clients and opposing counsel, but also with my four-year-old niece and with my friends and when you're trying to compromise or persuade people. And so I think that's just another misconception. And also the misconception that when you're talking, it has to be these big lofty ideas that no one understands. And I found that the public speaking speeches that always resonate with me, whether it's a video on YouTube or a leader is when they're just being authentic and mm -hmm. telling their own story. And I think it in through to Toastmasters, it really reminded me that you have a story that's worth sharing, that someone out there could really benefit from hearing it. And you don't need to embellish it or do anything other than just share it in a way that you that resonated with you, because it probably will resonate with someone else as well. Right, right. You know, we have, so, we have far more in common than we do our differences. And you know, that's something really important for us to understand. I've always said I should be the poster child for Toastmasters because the first time I got to speak, I was so nervous. My hand was shaking, you know, and it is so true. The experience that we have gained and by continually doing and doing and doing, we just get better. We might be nervous. We might be fearful, all of those things, but we just continue and it does really work for us. So good, really good information there. So I, this is one I really liked, a question we had. Is there anything fun about public speaking? Can you share with us the highs or what happens when people learn to overcome fear and gain confidence as speakers? Liz, how about that? How about the fun you find in, in public speaking? Sure. That's a great question and kind of funny because the act of preparing for a speech, I would say, is the opposite of fun for me. So you might, it's very counterintuitive. It's something that takes a lot of work, especially when I held myself to a standard of I was gonna give a speech every single week. Like I was determined to become a better speaker. And sure enough for, especially the night before the speech, I would be furiously practicing and re rewriting. And it was very uh, time consuming and kind of a little stressful. But after you give that speech and you get through it, it is such an indescribable high. Mm -hmm. And as I was thinking just in life as a 30 something year old adult, 
I'm a lawyer, very risk averse. And I realize as you get older that you don't really do things that you're not good at. And I don't take a ton of risks. And so therefore I don't get, you know, the bigger the risk, the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. There are very few things in recent memory where I felt like I really overcame this. And public speaking and Toastmasters has been one of those things where I wasn't really good at it. And yet it felt very counterintuitive to embrace something that I was not good at and to try to get better at it. And with each milestone that I checked off and each time that I felt I overcame this big hurdle where the five minute speech was a big deal in the beginning. And I think I could probably do a five minute impromptu speech uh, with very little practice now. I don't know how good it would be, but I'd feel comfortable doing it. And now doing maybe a 30 minute speech or an hour speech, like that's more of a challenge. But the, the thrill of overcoming something, I feel is something that I haven't really experienced as a child. And to be able to do that, and it's totally within my control, I would say is actually really fun. Mm -hmm. So we learned some of the techniques were those techniques that we learned that we could then put information into. And I think that's why it's, so we, it's better for us as we continue to build that speaking ability that we can take some of those techniques that are basic, but they work no matter what. So, Anweshe, what do you think about that one? What's fun about speaking? Well, when I think about fun as a public speaker, I, I think about it like this. For, in this era of technology, everything is so fast paced. If you are on internet or you're watching television, you can quickly switch a channel or close the tab because there are so many options. And here as a public speaker, you really have this crowd in a room where you have this chance to, or this opportunity to motivate them, to persuade them, to plant a brilliant idea in their head where they are having their full attention on you. They cannot switch you off. They cannot change the channel. I think that is really fun for me to get that opportunity to truly make a difference in someone's life because in the same way others have made difference in my life. A lot of Toastmasters have made my life different. Mm -hmm. So I find that fun. And mm -hmm. as far as high, I feel that a good public speaker really gets a high when they realize that the credibility of what they are saying goes up exponentially because they are now able to articulate their messages better. They are, they are able to communicate much better. And for me, my highs are really every, I mean, the whole Toastmaster journey has been a high for me. I mean, imagine me myself as an international student uh, originally from India, came here to pursue my graduate studies. And then I just joined Toastmasters to get better at presenting. But then I kept getting all these opportunities, one after the other, which led to my growth, uh, serving in different leadership role, getting the opportunity to be a TEDx speaker, or even in getting invited today, sharing this platform with all these amazing uh, uh, you know, panelists like John and Liz. So each of this moment, all of this moment gives me a huge high. Wonderful, wonderful. We're excited that we can get you excited today. John, did you <laughs> want to add something to this? I wanted to add something quick, which is that in the past, I would write a book and I would spend years on the book and then I would be asked to do a bunch of interviews and, you know, talk about the book. And I could never talk about it very well. So I would be passionate enough to spend years of my life devoted to something. And then I would explain it halfway with half my enthusiasm, half my ideas. I would get lost in my presentation and I wasn't terrible. I wouldn't start crying, but I would leave every time feeling like it was such a wasted opportunity to create something meaningful between the audience and I. And I just thought, I wasn't worried that they thought I was dumb so much as I just wasted everyone's time. And I felt really deeply regretful and bad about that, you know, really bad. And so I feel like, well, if you were gonna have lunch with someone or you're gonna kiss someone or you're gonna do anything, you don't wanna do it halfway. You really wanna do it. And so for me, the, it's not exactly the same thing as fun, but what's most meaningful about learning how to express my ideas now is that when I do it, I've done it. And even if I don't do it 100% perfectly, I feel like more or less I did it. So I don't have that regret. And I feel like whoever was listening to me got the benefit of what I had to say and I didn't waste their time. Mm -hmm. And that's tremendously meaningful, really satisfying. Now, I have long maintained as all of us are talking about today, that, you know, learning how to effectively communicate your thoughts, your ideas, it doesn't matter what you're studying, it doesn't matter what you're trying to say, what topic you're coming from, 
if you're not able to really present those ideas effectively, it doesn't go anywhere. So that's exactly what you're talking about, John. So thank you for sharing that with us. You know, that's what we're, what I really love about doing what we're doing and what Toastmasters has presented with these webinars, because we're learning a lot of different things from each other, but we're also learning how each of us are coming at this from a different angle, but with the results of being better communicators and how that's changing our lives and changing our world. So thank you for that. So let's go on to the digital part about it. In the age of, <clears throat> excuse me, digital communication, some may wonder, do people still give speeches? And what do you see as the practical benefits in daily life of knowing how to deliver and craft a message to your audience? So how do public speaking skills apply in today's world? Now we've talked quite a bit about that. So if you only wanna add a couple of comments, that's fine. But I'm gonna start with, uh, and I, I went, and Weishe, how would you respond to that? How do public speaking skills apply in today's world? Well, as far as when you compare it with digital communication, I, I always like to think like this. Ima imagine a juicy burger. It looks nice on a picture, but you can only experience it by just looking at it. But if when you're doing a public speaking a speech in front of a live audience, now you actually have the juicy burger in front of you in the same room, you can see it, you can smell it, and who knows, you might even get a bite of it. So that's how different public speaking or giving speeches is compared to just a digital communication. And as far as how public speaking skills apply in today's world, it's it pretty much something we're using every day. Just look at us, all three panelists here today. We are coming from very different backgrounds. But despite that, in our daily workplaces, we probably have to use the skills in some way or the other, whether it's communicating with our peers, colleagues, our boss, wh whoever it might be. So I really see that the skills that you're learning here is not just for public speaking, but it's overall to improve your communication. And communication is something we just need to be good at because you, we see the world around us where lack of communication or poor communication can just throw things in ori. So that's why I feel that every skill that we are learning as public speaker, it just is so applicable in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Liz, on this one? Um, yeah, so I... Man, I do not have a good metaphor like the burger, and that's actually making me really hungry because it's me too, me too. in Atlanta right now. But, um, but yes, I would just echo that. I think now more than ever, even though we are a digital society, and Weisha already beautifully covered all the reasons that we would need to communicate on a daily basis and not just negotiating, providing feedback, inspiring people. But I think in this more ever-connected world where people have access to all this technology. I also think people are feeling more isolated and lonely than mm -hmm. ever, and particularly in this time of a pandemic. And so I think back to the whole, the notion that Toastmasters helps you feel more confident and helps you feel that you have a story worth telling. I had mentioned that earlier. I think this idea of self-expression is really important. Being able to say what's on your mind in a way that's clear and articulate and in a proper tone so that you really feel heard. And I think that this, uh, the notion of communication, it's, it's not going away. In fact, it's just going to get more and more important, particularly as we are trying to connect over Zoom and other mediums that aren't in person, but you still need to get stuff off your chest. You still need to share your stories and your experiences. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And John, I'm gonna hold off. Uh, you can go ahead and respond to that in just a second, but I have a question specifically for you that might tie into this, but I want to make sure we get this question addressed to you. And if you want to add some comments about that, please feel free. But John, you wrote, recently wrote a book on the importance of public speaking to human connection, which kind of has a relationship to that digital communication. And you explore the concept that speech training helps people become less lonely and alienated. And you also argue that public speaking was a valued part of culture and education for centuries and should be brought back in modern public communication and education. Can you elaborate on that, please, John? I'm going to try. Let's see how, how well I can cover that because there's a lot there. But I think we think today of public speaking as this thing that we need to learn for business only. And it's so that we can give good PowerPoint presentations. And if you think about that, that's about 1% of your life tops. 
right? And so 2,500 years ago, when they invented democracy, the Greeks realized, oh, people are terrible at talking. And so they invented this whole discipline of public speaking. And their idea of it was really more like public speaking is when I'm taking the stuff inside my head and my heart and I'm getting it out of the privacy of myself and I'm putting it out into the world for public consumption. So it was a much bigger, broader understanding of public speaking and speech in general. And what they felt about it was that speech is like our operating system. Speech is the thing that connects us. It allows us to be known. It allows us to transmit information. And so one of the reasons that they taught it was because if people can't speak well in a democracy, they have bad fights, they have bad arguments, the quality of life is terrible for everyone. So you really need people to be educated about it. You need to be able to call out other people's BS. You need to be able to argue back with it in a non-destructive, non-abusive way. So from the most individual level to the social level, learning this skill enables us to be useful to other people, to be useful to our community. And so two or 300 years ago, so for 2000 years, this was the biggest part of education in the West. And then they stopped teaching it two or three centuries ago because it began to seem weird, basically. Science kind of took over and all of this stuff seemed really touchy feely and just kind of weird. And so now, if you look around at a lot of the problems, certainly in the United States, but also in the modern world, there's just a lot of isolation, alienation, everybody's talking through screens, politics get bad, you know, in the US is rising suicide rate, there's declining civic engagement, people don't join in clubs, they don't do things together and solve problems together in the same way that they used to, there's a lack of trust. And so in the middle of all these things, I kind of began to wonder, well, maybe it's because we don't learn public speaking anymore. We don't know how to literally connect with each other on the most literal obvious level of language and speaking. And so I'll give you an example. If I work at a company and I'm just as smart and my ideas are just as good as everyone else's, but I can't speak up very well and I see everyone else getting promoted ahead of me, how do I feel? Obviously I'm gonna be alienated. I'm gonna be angry. I'm gonna feel left out. And and in my private life, if I can't share myself and talk to people and I see other people kind of having a nicer time with other humans than I'm able to have, I'm going to feel angry and left out. And so add this up, I'm going to become kind of depressed. I'm probably not going to get promoted at work. It's going to look like I'm kind of dumb or kind of damaged or kind of depressed. And really the problem is not my IQ or my childhood or anything like that it's my ability to speak well. So I feel like speech education ties together all of these things and that's why it was such a big subject for 2000 years and that's why it's so important now. I really feel like it is the most practical skill set you will ever learn. Mm, I would agree with that wholeheartedly, John. Again, no matter what you have to present, if you can't put those ideas together. So that's a great segue into our next question. And Liz, I'm gonna start off with you on this one, please skills are typically a top requirement of job applicants. What situations in the modern marketplace demand public and impromptu speaking skills? How do you think that's important and why do you think that's so important in the workplace? Sure and again I can speak one from my personal experience as a business advisor and professional negotiator. When you're advising people or negotiating you are thinking on your feet all day long and you have to um, sound credible, you have to have the proper tone, you have to of course articulate your points very clearly and rationally, especially if you're trying to persuade other people. And so I would say those are skills that are um, very important. But I also wanted to point out another aspect of Toastmasters meetings that I completely never thought of until I joined a corporate club. Those meetings are run like clockwork. I mean, it, our club starts at 7.30 a.m. And it's pretty early for, for me, especially when I had to get dressed and get into work. But if you were there at 7.35, rolling in with your coffee, I mean, we've already started the Pledge of Allegiance and 
we've already gone into table topics. So you're late. And I think it just quickly made everyone, it raised everyone's standards because there was a strict agenda. And don't get me wrong, these meetings are very fun. You're hearing wonderful speakers, there's camaraderie, it's wonderful. But I think that alone really upped my game at work because when I run meetings, those meetings start on time and anyone who comes to my meetings knows that we're gonna have an agenda and I'm gonna to stick to it and I'm not gonna waste your time and we're gonna end on time. I mean, how many of us have been in work meetings where it seems a little disjointed, you don't really know what's going on, no one really seems to have control and people just drone on and on. And so I think one huge aspect of Toastmasters that I really underestimated would help me in my professional life was this level of professionalism and leadership that has nothing to do with speaking actually, but it's mm -hmm. really leading by example and showing that this is a, this is a very high quality caliber club for, for reasons not just related to speaking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I belonged to a corporate club for a while and we used to joke that you could always tell when the Toastmasters were running meetings because that's exactly right. We started on time, we had the agenda, we knew. So it's a skill that we definitely learn as well as presenting the ideas and the message. There are a lot of things that we learn in part of our Toastmasters journey. Anwesh, what do you think about this? Would you like to add anything about the workplace and communication skills? Well, it, as far as impromptu speaking skills at workplace, I think I have firsthand experience of how it helped me personally. It was I after right after my graduate school when I started applying for research position, I was scheduled to have an interview with this professor at a conference. And the night before or the evening before the interview, I was presenting a poster and the professor showed up at my poster. I was totally not expecting him. And he started asking questions. And that's where my impromptu speaking skills from Toastmaster kicked in because I had to present myself, my work. And I, I got the job. He's my current boss, actually. Mm -hmm. But after, uh, many months later, when I asked him that, uh, how do you really decide on hiring someone for a position? He said, most of the time, within the first five minutes, even if we have three hour interview, the first five minutes of how we present ourselves, it plants the idea in the head of the interviewer, whether they want to hire you or not. So that's why your impromptu skills, impromptu speaking skills have to, have to be top notch. You should be always ready to present yourself, to talk about yourself in any situation or no matter what the topic is, because you, you don't know where an opportunity will show up and we don't want to miss an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now we're coming to a point where we're going to have to end up this, these, wrap up these questions, which is absolutely amazing that the time has gone so quickly. But I want to put one more in. And John, I'm going to ask you if you'll start the response on this. And we'll see how much time we have. You know, we're talking a lot about being better speakers through Toastmasters and learning how to run meetings and agendas and that type of thing that we learn through Toastmasters and that confidence. But how can becoming a better speaker affect someone's ability to listen, think, and lead? What other aspects of life do you think that it touches? I think, I mean, I would almost reverse it. And I, this is something I learned from interviewing a lot of Toastmasters is that really you go to Toastmasters to learn how to talk better. And what you really learn is how to listen better. And then once you learn how to listen better, that's the key to really, really learning how to talk better. So if you talk about leadership or something like that, how often did you ever want to follow somebody who wasn't listening to you? You know, they may not agree with you, but you need to feel like, okay, that person at least heard me and maybe they rejected my advice or my input. Uh, maybe they're being, you know, driven by other things that they're thinking about. But I never follow anybody if I don't trust them a little bit, if I don't sense that they're paying attention, that they're capable of give and take. And I think in general, if you think about leadership, you know, the followers have given their trust and given some permission to the leader to be a leader. And that is never going to happen unless the leader listens and reflects back to the people. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Liz, how about you on this one? Um, and, and that answer was so perfect. I almost don't want to <laughs> follow that, but I, I would just really echo that. And I think um, the whole authenticity piece that John was kind of hinting at as well, like you want to follow people who are listening to you and who also are authentic. And I do think people have a very sensitive, BS meter, like they know when you're not being authentic. And I think Toastmasters was such a great outlet for me to 
have the self-expression to, it was almost cathartic to talk about my own experiences getting laid off or my challenges in my personal life or moving to a different country. And those were the, those were the experiences that made people resonate with me. Not when I was explaining, you know, presentations that were a little more explanatory or less personal, which could, could also be very, you know, excellent presentations. But, um, but I think that ability to connect, I mean, what an awesome opportunity to have these speeches at, at a club that you can use to connect with your audience and relate to them. Mm -hmm. And Anwesha, do you have some real quick comments to make on that question? Well, I think the only comment that I wanted to make is that by becoming a better speaker, I think we train our mind to really slow down and that affects our other abilities too because often our mind is racing and we are not fast enough in articulating that thought in words mm -hmm. or even articulating what others are saying. So by slowing down our brain processing and by becoming a better speaker, we become a better listener. We, it, it just it's almost like a, you know, this cascade effect that it, it just improves so many other aspects. But personally, I feel one aspect Toastmaster really improves or touches upon is our confidence. Mm -hmm. so that yes, is absolutely. an unmentioned benefit that we all get. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I see Jesse's back with us. So that means that time has flown by. Jesse, what else would you like us to talk about today? Thank you, everyone. That was a wonderful session. Some great information there. It is time for our Q&A, and we have some really good questions from our audience members. So, Tammy, our first question is going to be for you, okay. and this is from Kate. Kate says, I would love to hear advice for online meetings. I feel mm -hmm. like it's an extra challenge not having the energy of the audience reactions to feed off of. Mm, that's an excellent question, Kate, because I feel it too. I get the energy from the people around me. And it's very difficult to make that transition that oh, now I'm looking at these little blocks on my screen. And the best thing I would say with that, Kate, is just like we talked earlier in the session about learning the room, learn as much as you can about the technology so that those key points of the technology are second second so you can really focus on what you're talking about but go out there and learn how to use whether you're using zoom or microsoft teams or whatever you're using there are a lot of great tutorials out there so you can learn how to use the technology better so then that just allows you to shine as you're presenting your message wonderful our next question, Anwesha, this one's going to be for you. We've heard from a lot of audience members whose first language is not in English, and they're asking questions. Anita says, I think one of the biggest reasons that my lack of confidence in public speaking, I think the biggest reason is that English is not my primary language. Can you provide any insights or advice? And Anita, the problem that you're facing is probably faced by half the world because there's half the world who does not speak English. But English is it's just a language, but it should not be interfering with public speaking or ability to communicate. But no matter, but nevertheless, what I see is English will, is a primary language where a lot of countries are using if you are in, in United States for sure. So one thing will be taking one step at a time and working on English. And I did that too for myself, despite the fact that I grew, I grew up studying or completing my entire education in English. When I moved to US, the accent was very different. The, the sentence structures were very different. So I had to almost retrain myself in the language in a way that I could communicate here better. So it's never too late. You, you can always, even if you don't get perfect at learning the language, you can still practice enough to get good enough to communicate it better to the audience. If I can do it, so can you. Great. John, Dharmajit asks, how important is eye contact when you are speaking? That's a great question. And especially in all of these Zoom meetings, now look at me, I'm looking at you right now and now I'm looking at the camera. And I think that on some lizard brain level, we know when people aren't making eye contact with us and it bothers us. And yet with Zoom meetings, it's really, really hard to stare at a camera hole instead of a person. I interviewed the head of recruiting at Zoom for a piece that I was writing about interviewing in the era of Zoom meetings. And he said, look, we all know that this is a, 
an artificial thing that we're doing here, talking on Zoom, but you ideally have to acknowledge that fact and that preference that people have for eye contact. So obviously in Zoom meetings, it's kind of tricky and weird, but it's still really important, just like in real life. It's critical. I mean, I think ultimately what public speaking means, we don't listen to information very well, but we do evaluate people very well and very carefully. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, most of it, in fact, happens through our eyes, not even just through our words. Great, thank you. Liz, Renuk Devi asks, he mentions that fear really shows in his voice. It shakes and he feels like he can't control it. Do you have any tips that would help with overcoming that? And wow, thank you for sharing that vulnerable fact. And I think we've all been here. I, Tammy, you had mentioned that you shake. Rather than my voice, it, it's my hand. Like I couldn't stop it from shaking and I would grab it. And so other than like the obvious practicing, but I would, I wonder if, if he has been practicing with another person. And I know during isolation, it might not be easier, but I ask that because sometimes the things that you think are coming off when you're public speaking are, are not at all, or they're not as bad as you think they are. And so I did want to ask if, it, or encourage him to practice with someone else because it could be that it's they don't think it's shaking at all or that it's all part of it and i think as you start your speech i definitely have my things where my little ticks where i'll be shaking but as i'm more confident and comfortable with my material because i've practiced it again and again or it's something that's so personal to me that it's like second nature talking about it i find that once i get in the zone you you stop doing those things because in the beginning of course it's going to be there and I also want to reassure him that it happens to all of us, even to this day after years and years of, of speaking. But to tie in some of the earlier responses, I think even just standing up straight, looking someone in the eye and smiling, to me are three really easy, kind of low-hanging fruit ways to come off looking like you're more confident, even if on the inside you're freaking out and you're shaking. Great, thank you. Tammy, you've been a longtime member of Toastmasters, and Azar is asking, for those who have been members a long time, how do you stay motivated? Hmm. That's a great question, Azar. Now, I can tell you being motivated now um, in Toastmasters is different than if you would have asked me this question a year ago, because now I'm like relearning everything. I can communicate, I can put the messages together because of what I've learned with Toastmasters, but now I almost have this excitement of motivation of like, okay, how can I pull this off with a screen of people in front of me? So it changes a little bit now, and I think that that's actually helped motivate me in a way that now I have the message, but now I have a different way to convey it. So it's like a whole different element of communication that I am learning. and. I stay motivated by making sure that the material is fresh, no matter if I'm doing it on Zoom or live, but making sure the material is fresh and always looking around for more opportunities, more speech topics to present. So I think it's just whatever you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. And that's what I love most about Toastmasters. Great. John, Ahmed mentions that sometimes fear of public speaking causes him to lose vocabulary words and he can't think of words as quickly as normally. What advice do you have for how to overcome that? Great question and that happens to me all the time. I lose ideas, I lose my train of thought, I can't think of things that normally if I wasn't staring at a crowd or staring at a Zoom meeting screen that I would remember in a heartbeat. And the only answer is the same answers as always. It's preparation. It's thinking of the audience. The more I prepare, you know, one of the great intro rules in Toastmasters is not rules, but tips is to memorize your intro and your conclusion. If you memorize the first couple sentences and the last couple sentences, when your mind is all churned up, you kind of, you know how to start. You have this muscle memory kind of, and you also know where to go at the end. And that one tip I think is it, is emblematic of a lot of other tips. The more stuff that you have figured out and practiced in advance, the less likely you're gonna drop some words or ideas during your presentation. Great. Anwesha, 
Michelle is asking about virtual meetings and if you think those offer a softer introduction to public speaking. She mentions that she has much more for fear in person than in virtual meetings. Then this is the perfect time to get into public speaking because we are in a virtual world now and it gives us the opportunity to to really be in an environment where you're seeing everybody, but you, you can still avoid that presence of people in the room, which can be pretty nerve wracking for a lot of people. So I think this is a great time. And the other thing is, since it's virtual, it's, it's a softer way to also introduce yourself to a large variety of crowds. Because a virtual meeting, you can really join meeting any part of the world. I know in my home club, we have members joining from Sri Lanka. We have members joining from Canada, from Europe, and that just truly really makes it a global meeting. So now if you introduce yourself in the world of public speaking during this environment, you are becoming a global speaker, not just a presenter in your country. So this is the best time to do it or get started. Wonderful. Liz. We have a question from an audience member who wants to know about ums and ahs. What tips do you have for avoiding saying um or ah? Sure. And I, I hope no one was counting how many <laughs> ums and ahs and other filler words that I, I did during this session. So one of the ones that the tips that I learned while I was in Toastmasters that I still use is to just pause. Mm -hmm. We are so afraid of the pause. We think it's a really awkward silence, but the human brain cannot process that much information. And so sometimes a pause is extremely welcome because you've said all of these great points and you need to let the audience really digest it all. But I would say awareness is number one. So even though it's a bit of a blow to, to hear someone say, Liz, you've had 45 filler words during this meeting. You can't improve until you know what your weaknesses are and your blind spots. And once I knew what my favorite filler words were, it was just that much easier, or not that much easier, but I was aware now. But I do think that with everything as a theme that we've said over and over again, you can't get better if you don't practice. You have to, to do it. You can't you can't get in shape by watching someone else exercise. Like you have to run or get on a bike and do it yourself and you will get better. And those filler words will decrease, which is another huge win. And it'll make you feel really great. And the, the byproduct is you'll start noticing other people's filler words and it's gonna drive you crazy. But, um, but that would be my advice is to pause and to just be aware of what your words are so you can check yourself the next time you use them. Thank you. John, our final question is for you about humor. What are some tips for adding humor to your speech? This is, the, this is totally unfair because this question is impossible. And if you read public speaking books throughout history, they all throw up their hands when it comes to humor. Um, Cicero was this Roman guy who wrote the book on public speaking that was the book for 15 centuries. He was a bigger name in history than Shakespeare. I mean, this guy's immense and we've forgotten about him now. And even he's just said, when it comes to humor, <laughs> you guys are on your own. Everybody's on their own. Humor is just such a mercurial, weird thing that depends on being able to read the moment. Um, and I think with Zoom meetings, it's particularly hard because it's so much harder to read the moment. Um, I wish I could say something genius about humor. I will, uh, I'll have to think about it and get back to you. But I, I think like everything else with public speaking, it has to do with paying attention to your audience and really, really knowing them well. And natural and keeping it natural too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, you know, I, I keep, I'm like a broken record, but the more prepared I am and the more connected I am to what I'm going to say and what's the priority list of what I have to say and how to say it, the more freed up I am, I'm not wasting my energy on anxiety, the more free I am to be a goofball, which is kind of my normal character anyway. Wonderful. Thank you, John. And thank you, all of you. Thank you, Tammy and Weisha, John and Liz, for your time with us today. And we're really grateful for your tips and your wisdom to help us with our public speaking. It's and thank all of you for joining us. If you did enjoy today's session, please do register for tomorrow's webinar speak for yourself and that will be with another expert panel.
We will be sending you a recording, so when that comes, please feel free to send it to anyone who you think would benefit from the insights that we all heard today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming.